everyone, and welcome to the Thought Leader Series sponsored by the Masters of Science program in Positive Organization Development and Change at the Case Weatherhead School of Management. Today's Thought Leader Series is titled Reinventing Resilience, How Organizations Can Thrive Through Continuous Change. Our guest speaker, Paul Towner, is a proud 2009 graduate of our MPOG program and an organizational change consultant working with corporate, government, and nonprofit clients around the world. He started his own consulting practice, iPeaks Group, and is now a principal at Dagger Wing Group. He is also a speaker, a writer, and has recently released his first book, Reinventing Resilience. Welcome, Paul give you a chance to so we're going to talk a little bit about organizational resilience today and uh as promised we're going to keep that uh keep your phones handy because we're going to start with a quick quiz and it's a timed quiz you'll only have 40 seconds to answer the question if you're interested not obli not obligatory you don't have to do it but if you do uh you'll have just a few 40 seconds or so to come up with the answer this is for fun, no Googling, okay? So Scout's Honor, let's just use our use the knowledge we have, if we have any, and uh, try this. Okay, so here we go. Using the same link, uh, you can go to slido.com and just enter your name. It can just be your first name and first initial of your last name. It doesn't have to be your complete name or anything. Uh, just join the quiz and in about, once we get a bunch of people interested, look at everybody joining, so exciting. We will give you the opportunity to share your trivial knowledge capability. Okay, we'll let another 10 seconds to jump in if you're interested. We got some people jump. Thank you. So, uh, Weatherhead MBA grad. Well done. Ski resort. Op oh, Brian, yes, I remember you. Thanks for joining. Awesome. Okay. So if everybody's in the quiz who wants to be in the quiz, thank you for coming. Here is your question. Everybody ready? Three, two, one. Okay. Here we go. What country holds the annual World Headwinds Cycling Championship? No Googling. No Googling. We'll just give you 30 seconds to answer. 10 people have already voted. Exciting. 20 have voted. One have Amazing. Waiting on a couple more. What country? All of these countries listed are among the windiest countries in the world, by the way. Useless trivia for you. Waiting for two more. Seven seconds. Four, three, two, one. Okay, here we go. The correct answer is the Netherlands with 44 people, 44 percent of you selected the right answer. Uh, Azerbaijan is the windiest country in the world, in case you're interested in knowing that. Uh, and congratulations, Kevin, well done. Nine seconds it took you to find that answer. Uh, email me afterwards, I'll put my email in the chat. We have a special prize for you. Uh, com. There's, there's my email, so Kevin, shoot me an email. I'm gonna send you a copy of my book, Reinventing Resilience. And I'll even sign it for you if you're up for that. So congratulations. Well done, everybody. Really interesting, right? So what is the World Headwinds Cycling Championship anyway? Um, it is uh, held in Holland on the North Sea, right? There's a storm barrier called the Oosterscheldekering. I had to memorize that word. It's 18 syllables long. Uh, and it's 8.5 kilometers long, five and a quarter miles long. And this race is a time trial. So it's an individual against the clock, fastest time wins the race, and they can only hold the event when a big storm is coming. So they don't know the date in advance. They wait for a bit that they wait for the weather report. And when they see that the wind is going to be over 40 miles an hour, they call a race once a year and everybody comes up to northern Holland uh, and gets on one of these bikes, which is a single gear standard Dutch city commuter bike, one brake, one gear, and they pedal as hard as they can into a 40 mile an hour wind for the glory of being the Dutch World Headwind Cycling Champion. 
they sign up for this voluntarily. They do it on purpose. So I wonder when thinking about this race, I wonder how, if you could relate to this or your organizations can relate or your teams can relate to, to this because it seems like not only does it take a lot of courage and confidence to sign up for a race like that, um, but this is really what it's like <laughs> in the world right now. Cycling directly into a headwind uh, with a really heavy, lousy bike. Um, so I would. So as we talk about resilience today and organizational resilience, I'd like you to have this image, this guy, poor guy, this image in your mind as we talk about this today, because honestly, um, this is what we're facing. This this idea of pedaling directly into strong winds every single day and what keeps us going as organizations when we're faced with this kind of challenge on a day to day basis. OK, so let's talk a little bit about why resilience is important at all. And it's important because the only thing we can be sure of is that change won't stop. Right. So it's March 2023. I'm sure by now we were all hoping that um, we could turn the page on 2022 and things would be starting to feel a little bit more normal and whatever, you know, but yeah, I think we all know that that's may not happen. Um, we probably thought the same thing last March and then the March before that even, uh, but looking at the headlines, you know, we've got the Silicon Valley bank situation. We've got meta just today announcing another 10,000 people being laid off. Uh, so we know that volatility and uncertainty will continue. So instead of us wishing that normal would come back, I think we need to get better at growing through our challenges. So what's this got to do with resilience? So for my book, I interviewed dozens of leaders and did a ton of research to really learn what made organizations resilient. And interestingly, or some, what I found to be interesting was that the same ideas that help individuals build their resilience really did apply to organizations. So resilience scales. The most resilient organizations I noticed had this, this collective efficacy or this belief and staunch realism or what I call or awareness uh, that enables them to have the courage and confidence to really grow through challenges, not just survive them. And we're going to be, you'll hear that expression over and over again today. Uh, this describes a model that I that emerged out of my research, and we'll go into that in a little bit. Um, and today, I'm going to give you a chance to explore how resilient organizations can be and how to strengthen those organizations. But let's get to the why. So I wrote the book because the workplace is actually killing us. Um, workplace stress, as you know, is real. Uh, you may feel it yourself or have clients who are feeling that. Uh, but people are working around the clock and are just completely exhausted. I, you know, our clients at Daggering Group, you know, we mention this almost every single day. And one of the stats that I found really shocking when I was, re you know, reading more about resilience and workplace stress was um, a statistic by Stanford professor Jeffrey Pfeffer, who wrote a book called Dying for a Paycheck. And he said that the workplace is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. Now, that's just shocking to me. Um, and it's also backed up by a lot of other research from other global organizations, too. Like the United Nations, for instance, has declared occupational stress a global epidemic. And the World Health Organization regards stress as the most challenging health problem of our time. And even global leaders at Davos recently affirmed that stress is a killer. I mean, these guys fly in on their pri private jets and they believe stress is a problem. So it's definitely a problem. So of course the physical effects of stress on people are well-documented, uh, but the economic consequences are also alarming. Stress costs the US more than $200 billion in absenteeism, lost productivity, staff turnover, workers' compensation, medical insurance, uh, and other stress-related uh, expenses. Um, stress is definitely a global issue. The World Health Organization and the United Nations both talk about this, Debbie, as world problems. Uh, the stats that I have are mainly for the impact in the US, but um, there's lots and lots of other data. I actually, my editor, when I was writing the book, he said, please stop with the stats. There's too many in your book. So. Um, <laughs> So, 
but the, there are other factors like the great resignation and other things that have caused companies to take notice right and a lot of companies are have responded to this stress epidemic in a number of ways by providing programs to help individuals manage their stress which is great um maybe help them improve their overall well-being and even strengthen their own personal individual resilience these are really important but as oxford economist uh, jan emmanuel de neve said in a recent financial times article about workplace well-being he said you can't yoga your way out of these men more structural issues underpinning the mental and physical health and well-being of people so in short, it's not sufficient to just simply reduce stress. We actually have to increase renewal. And this is a, a, a concept Richard Boyatzis uh, works on all the time with individuals and in coaching. And I believe that this is uh, that we need to do this at scale in organizations. OK, so I wrote my book, um, Reinventing Resilience, to really explore how companies can overcome the effects of having chronically having a chronically stressed workforce. Besides helping individuals work on their own stress, could companies actually change the underlying structures so they don't contribute to workplace stress to worker stress in the first place? So my argument is that if companies work on building organizational resilience, they will not only have more productive workers, but they'll differentiate themselves among their competitors. So better workplace, better workers, better work, better results, less stress, longer lives. So if you're an organizational change consultant or a leader in your organization who's responsible for change, I would love for you to think of this webinar as, uh, and my resilience model as a way to talk about the tools that you know and already use in order to create positive change. So as you'll see, there's plenty of room for interpretation and it's not prescriptive. It's rather a framework to help you approach an organization and think about things in a new way. So book is called reinventing resilience so why does it need to be what is it and why does it need to be reinvented <laughs> um well we all know resilience is understood generally as the ability to bounce back from adversity right and that's definitely true but what's implied in this definition is that there's a focus on this ability to recover and return to that previous state before you got before you got knocked down but uh, for those of you old enough to remember Fleetwood Mac, uh, yesterday's gone, right? The, one of their songs, uh, classic rock songs, yesterday's gone. And so the old definition of resilience belongs to yesterday, and we know where yesterday is, right? So let's talk a little bit about the new definition of resilience and why I think we're doing it backwards. So think about it this way. This, by the way, this this is a, an adaptation of a, of a slide that I remember seeing in Ron Fry's class a million years ago, not to imply that Ron Fry's a million years old, but um, this is something that I adapted from one of his classes. Not, uh, and a lot of the work that I did is uh, uh, adap adapting uh, the work of much smarter people than me. But so think about it this way. Uh, we're at point A, uh, which is the status quo, and something happens to knock us backward to point B, which is you know, uh, where we perceive ourselves or maybe our organization as broken. Uh, and then we spend a lot of time and energy trying to get back to that point A again. Well, that kind of thinking actually limits our ability to contemplate growth and development when we're faced with a challenge since all we're trying to do is fix a problem. Uh, so if we look at resilience through a more positive lens, we can take a few lessons from the Dutch. So our companies, teams, and communities are actually always moving forward into those headwinds. Uh, you know, resistance is something that you know is part of the uh, part of the work of moving forward. Uh, we have to live with and adjust to the forces acting on our organizations. Right, the old adage: you can't change the wind, but you can't adjust your sails. Right. So that instead of uh, heroically facing down our challenges and hoping they'll just succumb to our will, right? That some, some <laughs> leaders try to do that. They force their way through these problems instead of adapting. Um, so the, for, the focus on returning to the previous state isn't necessarily bad. Uh, and there are times when that needs to be done, but it doesn't necessarily contemplate growth. Uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, contemplate renewal or thriving either. And fo focusing too hard on recovery keeps us in what I call gap closing cycles, where all we do is try to get back to where we were before we got, got knocked down. And that's really exhausting. 
So the, the and that definition really doesn't serve businesses who are trying to function in a very fluid and complex world because th by the time you bounce back to where you got knocked down, that that place is gone. There's no normal to bounce back to anyway, as we're all discovering. So what's more applicable, I think, to businesses is the other less discussed definition of resilience, which is the ability to adapt and thrive in the face of setbacks and challenges. In that sense, resilience involves growth and development. It's, and I believe it's time for organizations to embrace a strengths-based uh, aspects of resilience if they want to grow as opposed to simply survive. And for those of you familiar with the MPOD program or any positive psychology program, this should all sound very familiar to you. Okay, so doing change right the first time is more important than ever because there's a huge business cost to embarking on a change effort that seeks to return an organizational an organization back to its normal state because bouncing back really isn't transformational it's just you know stopping the pain organizations that organizations really need to be fit for the future uh, they need to build in the capacity to weather any storm and really ensure that workers are at their best every day so they can anticipate and respond to challenges as they come and we know for sure that they will just keep coming so resilience is um, an organizational strength and it's a differentiator in an increasingly challenging, unpredictable and volatile world. So let's look at the framework I created to help organizations think about building resilience at scale. And I'm looking for questions here. Great, great, great companies own pace. Thank you so much for your comments uh, and feel free to pop in questions anytime. Okay, so here is the reinventing resilience framework. Isn't it pretty? I love it. Uh, so based on my <laughs> based on my research into what makes organizations resilient, I kind of I created this framework. Um, some people call it the butter, a butterfly, some people call it a hummingbird. There's debates. But resilient organizations at their core, this is the teal center, the teal color in the middle, uh, have two important things in common and I've placed them in the middle of the framework intentionally, right? So they have collective efficacy or this idea of shared belief at the organizational level. They believe they can win it. They, they believe they can win even when things are tough. Uh, but they also have staunch realism or this keen self-awareness of the realities of their situation. They understand the world clearly and they don't sugarcoat it and they don't catastrophize it either. When resilient organizations have both belief and awareness, they generate the courage and confidence to grow through challenges, not simply survive them. So courageous companies are more likely to embrace change and uncertainty and to take calculated risks in order to pursue new opportunities and find creative solutions to problems. This might involve a lot of things, but you know, for example, trying out new business models, entering new markets or adopting new technologies whereas less resilient companies might be more risk averse, making them more vulnerable to disruption and less able to adapt to changing circumstances. In terms of confidence, resilient companies have a vibe of certainty and firm trust with their workers, even though success is not guaranteed. Confident organizations take the hard steps needed for transformational change. And so I think of um, Patagonia, for example, as a, a model for confidence, as they've taken their values to the next level. They, they live them fully, not only as an organization, but express them outwardly in the, in the work that they do beyond being a product company. Conversely, companies that are less resilient may be more prone to doubt and uncertainty, which undermines their confidence. So let's talk about how this model works, or at least in my mind, how it works. So the way I think about it is that organizations that don't have a particularly strong core culture can strengthen it by working from the outside in. That is working first on the four areas at the edge of the model. Um, and we're, we'll talk about these in detail in a few minutes. Um, but doing this helps them build courage and confidence to grow through their challenges and it strengthens the core attributes of staunch realism and collective efficacy. Also, 
the model works from the inside out as well. So when organizations do have a strong culture of staunch realism and collective efficacy, they become highly proficient at the four areas at the edge of the model. And when it all works together, it um, organizations can achieve a flow state where they are simultaneously working from the inside out and the outside in at the same time, which is what simultaneously means for those of you who don't know. Um, so this is like, I mean, the, the metaphor that I use for this is like an estuary, right? So for the, for an estuary is a, is a place where fresh water and salt water meet and uh, it creates a very unique and special ecosystem. Uh, and the water that's in this ecosystem is called brackish water because it's not really salty, it's not really fresh, it's a little bit of each, it's a combination and only certain things can live there. And when that gets disruptive, that ecosystem collapses. And this is how I think about resilience. So the constant flow of organizational learning and experimentation creates a similar unique and resilient ecosystem that grows through its challenges and not simply survives them. So we're not creating bounce back cycles, but rather a growth cycle for an organization. Okay, so now we're gonna get into some specifics about the model and um, walk through the four areas on the outside, assuming that, um, they're, that the organizations you work with or are in could benefit from maybe practicing some of these areas on the outside of this model. So. How companies, um, how might companies build resilience, right? So they can have the courage and confidence to grow through challenges. This is where those of you who are OD practitioners or uh, internal change agents, maybe your HR business partners, your coaches, uh, you have the ear of, of executives. This is where I would love to get your thoughts and input as well, because you probably will start seeing ways to apply your own toolkit uh, to organizations as we talk about this model. So please feel free to chime in uh, on your own, but I'm also gonna be asking you anyway, so get ready. Cool, all right. So let's talk about blockers. This is the upper left-hand corner of the model. Um, and a blocker is anything that holds a company back from achieving its objectives. Um, and blockers aren't always specific people, but I'm sure we all know some. Uh, that are, <laughs> but oftentimes the real blockers lie beneath the surface and are very hard to see. So we can feel them though, like we kind of sense them, we know they're there. Uh, we can, so especially when an organization is responding to a crisis, the underlying blockers can affect how an organization responds to those crises. Maybe it's, you know, uh, you know, some history that they have or some patterns of behavior that uh, cause them to react in a specific way, almost reflexively. Uh, have, have any of you had that experience, have seen an organization react in a way where you know that there's some underlying blocker at play that's keeping them from perhaps thinking as clearly as they can think or coming up with a, the, a range of solutions or possibilities that would actually help them? Uh, I'm, I'd be very interested to hear if any of you have seen or uh, had that experience. But by identifying and addressing organizational blockers, a company can really begin to start, uh, can begin to remove obstacles to its success and improve its ability to adapt and find solutions for challenges. So in my book, I tell the story of Protagonist Therapeutics. Uh, it's a publicly traded pharmaceutical company. Um, they had a promising clinical trial of a drug to treat irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, and the market was really anticipating great results because they had been talking about it. But unfortunately, human error uh, scuttled the trial, really messed it up, <laughs> which led to a public admission that the data that they got was insufficient to declare their drug a success. It was a big problem. The, the CEO was quite masterful in how he responded to this. He navigated all the potential blockers in his organization. Uh, and instead of going on a blame finding mission, um, he uh, he took the long view, actually. He had confidence in his team and the technology, and he assured the team that the drug would eventually make it to the market. The street, on the other hand, <laughs> uh, punished the company's stock. Uh, but to their credit, 
they employed a number of really resilient practices to avoid running into their blockers. So they slowed down, they took stock of the situation, they put the situation in a broader context, they recognized the pain uh, and acknowledged that, uh, and they had enough collective belief that they not only could overcome the setback, but grow and thrive as a result of it. So I'm really curious, this is, this is where I'm asking you a question. I would love for you to start get, getting your fingers ready to type in some thoughts here. So how do you help your help organizations or the organizations you work with or for, how do you help those organizations identify blockers that could hold them back? Is it a model, a methodology, a toolkit, a, uh, a theory, uh, an approach? How do you help organizations identify blockers? Just pop those in the chat and we'll collect these and share them out at the end for everybody, including those watching on video. How might you help organizations identify the blockers that hold them back? I'm going to type that question in here. Just in case anyone wants to type anything in, it'll show up right there. Cool. Excellent. Building trusting and solid relationships with the CEO, very important. Where the truth can be told. Yeah. Oftentimes, uh, executives don't have um, a trusted advisor to share with them the real truth, and they to sort of show them that they or others may be blockers that are, that are holding the organization back. That's a really important thing to do. Mapping the system, reviewing which elements help and hinder. Absolutely. Loads of complexity to evaluate, even just sort of acknowledging that there is complexity and sort of like going down that path of trying to uh, identify those that identify parts of it are really, really critical. Excellent. Gathering people together, asking what's going well, fantastic. Sort of sensing, sensing what's going on in the organization. Excellent. This is really helpful. Great stuff. Describe the organization as a metaphor. That's a good one. Really interesting there. Value stream mapping. Great stuff, everyone. Thank you so much for all these great suggestions. Keep them coming as I, I can share a little bit more here. I'm going to move on to the situation and I'm not talking about Jersey Shore for those of you old enough to remember MTV. Um, companies that are able to understand and accept the reality of the situation are better able to assess accurately and make informed decisions based on the facts rather than being swayed by denial or wishful thinking or other cognitive biases. So for example, if a company is facing a downturn, uh, in the market or a significant change in its industry, it's important for it to understand the full extent of the situation and the implications for its operations, right? So we're, a, a situation that many companies are facing right now, for example, is this new attitude employees have about work. Uh, it, quest, it calls into question long held beliefs about where and when and how we do work, right? And we're seeing it play out in public right now. Companies are uh, responding in different ways. Some companies are accepting the situation and adapting. Hey, flexible work policies, everybody can work from home, do what you want, let's compromise, that kind of thing. And others are fighting that reality really hard. You must come back to the office tomorrow, five days a week, no questions asked. We're just gonna go back to normal because we think normal is there for us to bounce back to. But so it's really interesting so that but the reality of the situation is that workers have a very different perspective and belief around uh around what work is where it should happen and how it should be done and uh, companies are in a position now where that is uh, a, a headwind that they need to deal with so how might we uh do that so accepting the situation is really an act of overcoming inertia so how many of us have worked with uh, an executive or a leadership team that are kind of unwilling to acknowledge the depth of a problem, right? Or maybe they, they're focused on their own functional area 
uh, in order to avoid some bigger issues. Or maybe they divert attention or blame, uh, blame their teams when a strategy isn't working. These are, um, you know, maybe this, you know, I, I look at this as folks who'd rather rearrange deck chairs on the Titanic instead of heading to a lifeboat. Uh, for those of you who watch Dr. Jambayeva's uh, transformation uh, uh, thought leader series webinar a couple months ago, this is what she was talking about. So regardless of how leaders tend to respond, they must work on their ability to collectively understand and accept the situation for what it truly is. So just like individuals who are in therapy who are encouraged to adopt the practice of radical acceptance, organizations need to do the work to really figure out what is within and outside their control. So when they do, they stop spreading kind of like uh, PR or communication stories that nobody believes anyway, or narratives that nobody believes anyway. And they're more honest about the work it will take to get from where they are now to where they need to be in the future. So here's my next question to you. How do you help leaders see the situation for what it truly is? What do you do? Is this a private conversation, a public conversation? Is there a strategy, a technique, powerful question, um, gathering? Um, do you do it at an offsite? <laughs> where, where do you help leaders see the situation for what it truly is? Or how do you encourage them to put on a different lens or widen the aperture a little bit to see what is truly going on versus what they hope is going on or what they think may be going on? It's a tough one. It's all about inertia. I'll type this in the chat as well. Q&A, Q&A with teams and leaders, really good strategy, uh, especially if you have um, sufficient uh, authentic, you know, uh, psychological safety or, or comfort um, openness in the, in the culture to have that. Conversations, yep. Dialogue is absolutely important. Data, ooh, that's interesting. Celebrate sharing, continue exploring the underpinning of the situation. Fantastic. These are all really, really great suggestions. Informal connections. Yeah, formal and inf informal um, strategies are really, really important. But I think getting the ear of those leaders and uh, ensuring that they see um, uh, an alternative version of reality, maybe a, a different narrative that could be just as true and convincing them that, hey, you know, this is... Uh, what you believe is is perfectly legit and valid. And here's another another thing to think about and another uh, how other people may be seeing it or how, how I may be seeing it. How do we reconcile these different versions so that we come up with one that we all believe is true? That's a, that's a big chunk of work. And I'm sure you've all been in those situations where you've had to do that with, with folks and it's not easy. Excellent, check-ins. This is a hard one, yep, for sure. Yeah, some leaders aren't ready for those conversations, definitely. Egos are involved, for sure. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about, thank you for those great suggestions. Really appreciate them. I uh, want to move forward to resources. So resources in my model here are the strengths that often go unused when an organization is... Um, uh, suffering from a collective amygdala hijack. We all know what an amygdala hijack is, right? That's when we are in our fight, flight, or freeze mode all the time. Um, a client I work with just had a, uh, its second really bad earnings call in a row, uh, and they have a new CEO, and their product pipeline is not terribly convincing to investors. So the stock price is way, way down and people are heading for the exits. It's truly peak stress time at that organization and it's really hard to watch. Um, this is when organizations, it's times like these, right? When organizations tend to go into react mode and they forget the resources they have at their disposal. And I'm not talking about money or headcount. I'm really talking about, um, you know, the talent and experience, for instance, of the people, like what do they actually bring to the table? Maybe it's not in, even in their formal daily role, but other experience, other talent, other uh, knowledge that they have. Maybe it's also 
the wins and lessons from the company's better days, you know, some acknowledgement that, hey, we've been through hard things before and we can get through another one, or even the variety and diversity of thinking that can involve, that can create innovative solutions, you know, bringing more people to the table as opposed to what you typically happens where a small group circles the wagons and tries to protect everybody else from um, the, the, the real news that's going on. Um, but they just can't, you know, typically what happens is, you know, this react mode prevents people and leaders in particular from bringing their brains fully online to access all of those resources that are at their disposal. So what I, I believe resilient organizations are much better at accessing and tapping into their resources uh, more easily because there are, they are less apt to be stuck in a negative bounce back cycle where the goal is to simply just stop the pain. So for those of you who, you know, study emotional intelligence and the neuroscience stuff, right, we all have our own individual amygdala moments where we're hij our, you know, our amygdala is hijacked and we can't, uh, we can't think clearly, right? Our executive function is shut off and we're just in response mode all the time. I believe that happens in organizations as well. So I would love to hear from you about when that happens. If you've been in a situation in an organization, when that has happened, how have you helped to bring, uh, bring to the surface the untapped resources in an organization, like to help folk, help either a leader or an executive team or someone else take a minute, take a breath, and to see, um, widen the aperture a little bit and see additional resources that, are, that they may be overlooking because they're captured by the moment. What do you do typically? Appreciative questions. Spoken like spoken like an empod. Well done. Reframing questions, appreciative questions like that are oftentimes very disarming and very helpful in those moments. I love that. Uh, take a breath. Um, let's unpack this, right? So we don't have to like be stuck in that moment. We can actually uh, take some time to think about this, for example. see other companies practices, right? So like, take a look and say, you know, we aren't alone. Other people have been through th similar things. So if they can do it, we can do it kind of idea. Really great. Um, past successes, what made them happen? What, you know, when were we at our very best, right? That's like the uh, ultimate appreciative inquiry question. You know, let's talk about a high peak moment uh, when this company was really fully alive and firing on all cylinders. Uh, point to challenges we've mastered in the past, all that great stuff. Absolutely. I think these are really important. And those questions really open the door to accessing those resources. They don't necessarily solve the problem, but they do give folks an opportunity to think and, and collectively think about what's possible, where we might be able to um, be creative and innovative in using what we've got to solve our problem potentially. Excellent. Thank you so much for those awesome suggestions. Uh, what's you know what's down what's underneath it all absolutely for those of you who love uh, gestalt theory you know what is in the ground and what is figural also really interesting stuff for folks to try to get to why is this popping up right now for people as opposed to it's been there the whole time why why now what is it that triggered that cool okay so in the interest of time i'm going to keep moving on to possibilities here um so in my book, I talk about a panic attack that I had while I was hiking in the Grand Canyon. I was on this narrow path or this narrow, narrow trail, and it was really on the edge of a huge chasm. And I panicked. I just, I froze. So the hiking guide that was with us uh, helped me not only to, to regain my composure, but also see that survival was indeed possible. And I'm truly grateful with that person. Um, but he didn't workshop it with me. You know, it's not, it was pretty obvious what needed to happen. You know, we didn't like come up with, you know, 50 ideas for moving forward and then narrow them down to like three, three that I, you know, my top three and then pick one and then, you know, write a commitment card about it. We just talked and it was really, really helpful just to uh, have the opportunity to have the, the, to, to decide for myself and to have the possibility emerge from the conversation that the first step could happen, even if it was a small step. And that uh, really stuck with me as I was thinking about this book, you know, what's the difference between generating ideas 
versus just um, just taking action. And when I think about uh, companies that get caught in uh, cycles of ideation, uh, you know, they can that can happen, right? So we love looking into the future. And we love coming up with really great creative, you know, solutions, divergent thinking, design thinking, all this great stuff is really, really important and good. Um, it feels really great to generate those ideas and to envision that positive future. But I think there's a difference between dreaming and planning, you know, without a good understanding of an organization's blockers, the situation and resources, those things we just talked about. I think someone's unmuted. So if you want to, thank you. Um, if without an understanding of those things that we just the three areas we just discussed, the possibilities we generate have run the risk of becoming not terribly helpful. Maybe they're so wild and out there that they're never going to happen. And it's just a waste of a post it note really on the on the on the wall. Um, but we need to uh, come to these ideas and these possibilities with great care, because so much is at stake in organizations, not just the bottom line. But the well-being of workers who are committed to the organization's success, these are the folks who are actually going to be doing the work. And if we're not mindful of how it impacts them, then I think we're doing them a disservice. So one of the stories that I tell in the book, actually retell in the book, is the story of U.S. Navy Captain uh, Mike Abershoff, who took command of the worst ship in the Navy. Uh, I actually first learned about this um, story in, in, the, in my MPOD program. He won over the 300 person crew by um, by learning about each sailor's personal life, their, what's, what's real for them. He, he asked about what kept them uh, from being committed and really what factors prevented them from being effective and really what they needed. Uh, so from there, he was able to transform the ship into one of the most celebrated vessels in the Navy. And he, you know, he did for the crew what my guide did for me, he helped them discover possibilities and he did it through dialogue and through um, understanding and just really uh, openness to, you know, co-creating the possibilities uh, with, with his crew. So this is a um, <laughs> good job, John. I know it's an oldie, but a goodie. It's a great book. Uh, I think I actually have it here somewhere. Um, the best damn ship in the Navy, I believe is the title. Uh, but I'm really interested in hearing from you now about um, when you like, what do you, besides appreciative inquiry, hopefully that's a sort of a staple in your toolkit. Uh, what are the resources or tools, even if it's a, you know, powerful question, a, a worksheet or a model or a framework or an idea, an approach, what do you use to help organizations discover possibilities for themselves in a way that provides them with pragmatic, uh, realistic possibilities that are also a stretch for them. Curious to know how you, what you use, how do you manage that? How do you keep it from being so divergent that it, it, it becomes uh, challenging to even sort it out and that kind of thing. So what do you think? How do you do that? This is my last question. So if you're, if you're sick of typing, this is it, your last chance to type. Does anybody recommend a, any um, books to their teams or leaders, any uh, articles, resources, things like that? Oh, a great mural for brainstorming. Mural, the online platform, I'm guessing, right? Uh, mental health space to truly be yourself. Absolutely. Questions, uh, gathering some data, right? Look at possibilities, then looking at the themes of the data, online platform, that's mural, thank you. Design thinking, also great, very good. And then, you know, especially with design thinking, understanding what constraints you're going to put around the ideation process to make sure you're, you keep the ideas reasonable, hopefully. Uh, asking what do we aspire to be, what do we aspire to? What in your mind is the best possible outcome of this? These are great, really, really great. And hopefully these are all ideas, resources that you can all use. And I'm going to share them all with everybody uh, afterwards so that we can all have a good 
uh, add some additions to our toolkit. Amazing, amazing. Project Dialog. I don't think I've heard of that one, but I love it. I'm going to check it out. Thank you. I'm learning things every day. Okay, so last thing here is really just to thank you. Um, so this is a, a quick tour around the model. I really hope it sparked some thinking for you, uh, and I hope it can provide a framework for you to have new and productive conversations with uh, the leaders you work with, your clients, uh, you know, your team members or others in your organization uh, that, you're, that you work in or, or serve. Um, and I would love to you know, hear in a few months time uh, how you use the model, uh, because we clearly need to end the workplace stress epidemic. And hopefully by providing this to you, you can do a little bit every day to uh, make the workplace great for those who, who work there um, and, and you know, attack, not attack, but address the underlying structural issues that create uh, workplace stress every day. And I, I, uh, I encourage you to share with me how you apply this because it's gonna be really, it'll be really cool to see how that's all done. And we have a couple minutes for questions and here it is folks. Here's your freebie. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you want to download the um, intro to my book, you can just, uh, this is a different QR code, by the way, than the, than the quiz, uh, or you can just use that uh, link there, land.highpeaksgroup.com slash mpod. You can, um, there's a little button there that says download the intro. You can grab it for free right now, get started reading. Um, so um, also on that page, you can sign up for my newsletter. I don't do a lot of spam. I'm actually not that regular in creating a newsletter anyway, so don't worry about getting too much email from me. But what I wanna do is uh, post opportunities um, that where you can connect with other like-minded folks to discuss ways to end workplace stress and to build up uh, resilient organizations. So if there is a groundswell of interest, I'll, I'll start connecting people and we can uh, start having an interesting dialogue and discussion about what's working for, for organizations. Um, and I'm happy to stick around, by the way. Uh, we, we'll take some questions here from folks and I can stay until 1.15 Eastern time if people want to hang out. If you have to leave at the top of the hour or now, I totally get it. Um, thank you for joining. I really appreciate your time and, and thanks, Pat and the whole case crew for uh, inviting me to this uh, thought leader series. It's been awesome. And it's great to see so many friendly faces out there. Any questions from folks that I didn't answer yet? Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, Karen. Debbie, hey, thank you. Pleasure. Bye. <laughs> And so I downloaded it's like 17 pages, but that's just, is that just the intro? Or that's, that's yeah, yeah, that's just the intro. Don't worry, the book's not that much longer. Okay, so we don't get the whole book. Okay, cool, this is it. Yep, the intro, the intro, yep. Okay, thank you. So Paul, while we have a moment, I see a lot of people are leaving, so. I just want to say that uh, it's a thank you for coming today and for presenting to us and for also generously giving your time to stick around for 15 minutes or so afterwards. I want to take this opportunity to also invite everybody to join us next month when another one of our MPOD alums, Aaron Rocchio, will present from burnout to flourishing, cultivating wholeness at work. And for your convenience, I'm going to um, put the registration link in the chat. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we did record this session. I'm going to be emailing it to all of you and uh, that way you can view it at your convenience. But also we wanna encourage you to share it with others. So again, thank you for coming and joining us today. And thank you, Paul, for um, this inspiring and informative presentation. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Paul, I've, I've got a question for you. Uh, my yes. name is John. I'm, I'm an MPOD uh, graduating in 2024. Excellent. Um, so I'm curious if you have some moments from your, uh, from your career or like maybe that stimulated the idea for this model. Are there other points, you, moments or situations that you can point to that sort of uh, plant the, the seeds for this model in the book? 
Yeah, it's it. Well, it's I think the story there is really the story of why I even wanted to do MPOD myself in, in the back in the day. Um, I I started my career um, or I, I ended up in a as a executive director of a nonprofit organization in the education reform space and uh, turned out I was a terrible boss. Uh, I was, um, you know, unsympathetic. My staff was crying. I was kind of a hard ass and uh, didn't really kind of know that there were other paradigms of leadership out there to, to work with. And I didn't know how to run my organization that well. And my sister, who's also an Empire grad, suggested I do this program, mainly for the executive coaching component. But as I as I quickly learned in the program, the that we made a lot of stuff on strategy and and uh, you know obviously how to manage organizational change that was a, obviously the main part of it. Um, it helped me become a better leader, and I'd always been really curious about what it is that made uh, individuals or teams work, especially if they were you know largely comprised of similar types of folks, like similar you know um, you know you know even in the same company you know, different teams can have wildly different experiences or different results. And that was always really fascinating to me about why that was the case. And it was through the MPOD program that I was able to, you know, understand that much, much better. Um, so yeah, so all of that uh, led me to want to explore this idea of, um, you know, why, why workplaces are the way they are. But when it comes to workplace stress, I mean, that's, that came from watching my mom go to work every day at Three Mile Island. You know, she was, uh, she worked on a, 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 a rotating shift. She was always exhausted. She was the only woman in her all male team. She was treated very badly. Um, so uh, the, the effect of her workplace rippled through our family. Uh, and I was like this, you know, if, if I can do something to help that, I'm gonna try. Thanks for sharing that, appreciate it. Any other questions? I see Edwin joined. Thank you, Edwin. I, we, we just connected on LinkedIn, so and some folks are dropping. Well, thank you so much for for joining. Uh, you can always reach me. I'll just pop my email address one more time in the chat so you can all uh, see it. Um, if you want to. Um, reach out to me directly, you're more than welcome. Uh, you can also grab that link and uh, sign up and we'll put some people together and see if we can get some positive momentum going to end the workplace stress epidemic. Awesome. Is anybody waiting for more people to drop so they can chat after one o'clock or are we ready to, ready to wind down? Looks like people are ready to wind down. Thank you all so much. I love the I love all the notes in the chat. Thank you for keeping me uh, buoyed during the conversation. It was really lovely to uh, have all your support and encouragement throughout this conversation. <laughs>